All right. Now, as the last lecture in dynamics, I have three topics to cover today. The first one is energy methods. And this is a topic which is essentially developed in dynamics, undergraduate dynamics, but will be used extensively in your continuing education by other taking other advanced courses. Especially mechanical engineers, when you learn this in the design of mechanical or kin kinetics of mechanical components or mechanical systems, you're going to utilize the concept of energy methods extensively. For civil engineers, you will not see this until maybe partially in uh, fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics. And then the other one is, like I said, the graduate course I'm teaching now, structural dynamics, which means that once you finish this dynamics, your, your dynamics knowledge will go into hibernation for maybe a few years. And then when you get into grad school, you will have to find a way to wake up, to remind yourself that this is something I learned two or three years ago. And that's why you are taking notes. And the second topic I want to talk about is just like I said, this is the bridge topic between dynamics and structural dynamics, which is a free vibration of a single degree of freedom system. In fact, if you think about it, we have been talking about single degree of freedom systems since the very beginning. Everything we talk about, even though it's a, maybe a complicated, maybe assembly of different mechanical components, but every time we only look at the dynamic response of one point. You either look at the behavior of point A or point C or point D. Every time is one. If you think about it, right? And even you want to calculate some information, maybe relative motion between point A and point B, but you are always been provided with discrete information at a given point. So that being said, every time when you carry out your calculation is always what we call single degree of freedom system. Another reason for that is because we don't consider the deformation of any mechanical, any system that we consider in dynamics. And that also makes a big difference. For example, when we consider the motion of a, uh, a mechanical system, we never consider that this mechanical system could actually deform. Or when we consider that the force applies to a beam sitting on the spring. That's actually example, I don't know, 33 or 32. Do you think that the beam, whatever the beam is made of, could be made of steel? Could it be made of wood? Could it be made of reinforced concrete? Do you think the beam is going to deform? Of course, yes. There's no perfect rigid body in this world. You must know that already. And that means what? That means we ignored deformation of any kind of objects with mass in this dynamics, and you must know that that's not true. So in multi-degree of freedom system, in structural dynamics, that's the point we're gonna start considering that, what if we want to know the motion of an object by considering not only the kinetic energy or the strain energy, but also the internal deformation? How do we handle those kind of problems? And that's why you need to go to grad school to learn those techniques and i will give you a quick example and also by distinguishing the difference between dynamics and structural dynamics and after that if i have maybe five or ten minutes i will conduct a very brief final review and it's just to put all the pieces in the big picture so you know what i promised you at the beginning i said dynamics is one thing Unlike many people claim that say the dynamic is assembly of many different, I mean, isolated topics, I, am, I strongly disagree upon that. That's not true. If somebody says that, that means you don't understand dynamics. Dynamics is actually all, they're all related. If you see the connection, you know it's part of a system. As long as you understand the system, that understanding will stay with you, perhaps until the rest of your life. And that's my hope. And teaching this dynamics. Okay, so let's get started with energy methods in dynamics. Again, I will not be able to give you examples because of the time 
we have in this very last class. However, uh, before I continue, let's recall what kind of energies that we have learned in this dynamics. We have what? We have kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy is denoted by capital T and capital T equals to one half of the linear component and also the angular component. A linear component is what? One half of mass times linear velocity. That's why you said, I said it's a linear component, squared. That's the linear component. And of course, if you have velocity, this is what else I said earlier, you must know the velocity at the time instant, which also means that this kinetic energy quantity is also the kinetic energy at that time instant. It's not the kinetic energy from the beginning all the way to the end. No, kinetic energy will change. So once you know the velocity, that represents the or related to the kinetic energy at the time instant. The other component is what we call angular component, which is the one half of mass moment of inertia times angular velocity. So this, just by looking at this too, you must know that the first one, because the linear velocity, so the mass represents translation of motion. The second one is angular velocity, and that must represent the angular motion of the kinetic energy. So this whole thing is kinetic energy in general. What else we know? We also know what? Strain energy, or it's called elastic energy, right? What do we call it? The full name we we'll call it is elastic potential energy. What do we call it? We call it Vs, right? We call it Vs. So what is Vs? Vs also has two components because elastic potential energy represents the energy stored by a spring. And they, of course, can be linear spring and angular spring or rotational spring. For the linear spring, this is one half of spring constant times corresponding elongation square. So I think we use S, so let's use Ks square. The K here is the linear spring constant and the S is the corresponding elongation or what? Contraction or the shortened distance. The other part, is the angular part, which is associated with rotational spring. And I think I use k theta, right? That means this is, the k here is the linear spring constant. The k theta here is the angular spring constant times what? Times the angular displacement square. So this is the general form for elastic potential energy. And what do we also have? We also have gravitational potential energy, right? You must know that there are two types of potential energy you've been introduced in this dynamics. Elastic potential energy and gravitational potential energy. For well, gravitational potential energy is easier. We denote it by symbol Vg, and this equals to just mass times gravitational acceleration times the corresponding displacement in the vertical direction. So, the third term here is also displacement, but you have to know that it's not any displacement, but the displacement in the vertical direction, which we call the change in altitude. So I'm going to call it S because it's still displacement. Now, be careful also that this gravitational potential energy could be positive or negative. Unlike all other terms, kinetic energy must be positive. Elastic potential energy must be positive but gravitational potential energy could be positive or negative, right? That's all the energy terms we have learned. Now, that's what we know in 
undergraduate dynamics. So what are the energy methods? The first method, which you will learn later on in other advanced courses, is what we call Hamilton's principle. 